Father, we pray for uh, Randy and that his uh, surgery won't be delayed any longer and that he'll have a good outcome. And for uh, Steve, that his uh, problem with his bowels will find a solution and, and that they'll have, have a safe trip home. And uh, for Kim and Sue, that they get through the uh, trials after at the big surgery on the knee. And also for uh, Roger, uh, yes. we always think yes. of him as he uh, working with this uh, prostate problem. And uh, we ask for a blessing to send the Holy Spirit on our Bible study tonight and that we'll uh, learn what you'd have us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Now Roger and uh, Ellen, they're taking uh, Lonnie's four boys to do yes. a little program tonight. <laughs> oh. uh, they're staying close to those boys. And, yes, they uh, are. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of neat, kind of neat to watch that. Okay, anybody else? Our answer, our prayer was kind of answered with Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, we prayed last week that while he was in, <clears throat> and I, I'm just going to say it's an answer to prayer. I, it really doesn't know anymore. But it, so he's doing the hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, mm -hmm. and it's not gotten any worse. It hasn't really gotten any better. So let's keep an eye on it. Yeah. But that's good news, right? That's good news. Yeah, that's good news. Exactly. Um, as we pray for Roger, let's remember. Um, you know, he would like to not have another surgery. Yes, of course, yes. we all have that when we're sick. But uh, something like that might happen. That would be radiation this time instead of surgery. Okay, anybody else? Well, we've been studying Revelation 19. The last one we studied was verse 10. Anybody right off the bat can tell, tell me what verse 10 says? Revelation. The testimony of Jesus. Is the spirit of prophecy? prophecy. Yeah. Also, in that same text, the angel is, uh, is uh, refusing to worship the God. Revelation 19. Let's start with verse 11, 11 to 21. Maybe each of us could read uh, maybe uh, five texts. Do uh, you want to start us off, uh, Jeannie? Uh, Revelation 19, 11. Read about five texts, and we'll go on up to the end of the chapter. And we'll make some comments about it. And as we go along, maybe you have a thought. Like you express. Revelation 19, starting with verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Let's stop there just for a minute. It says here that uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire, so forth. This is highly symbolic language. As we read down through here, these are, this is highly symbolic. Uh, not much literal here. Uh, and uh, so we need to know what the symbols mean before we can interpret, right? A little later on it says his, uh, his uh, tongue is like out of his mouth was a, a, a two-edged sword. Well, what is that? The scripture. It's, it's the Bible. There's word. Yeah, exactly. Two edges sword. It says that in Hebrews four twelve. So anyway, look at the, think of the symbols as we're going along here. This is a description of the of the Battle of Armageddon all over again, and the second coming of Jesus at the same time. It all happens right at the end. The conclusion of it all. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay. Okay. 
And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the air, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and all those who sit on them, sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. And I saw the beasts, the king of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beasts were captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, of which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These are the two who were cast alive into the lake of fire for the beast. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay. Highly symbolic language. This is really another description of Armageddon. What is Armageddon? Is it uh, primarily a what? Spiritual, spiritual battle. battle, exactly. Now let's read some similar texts that help describe this, define this a little bit better. Let's go to Revelation 13, 13 and 14, and kind of compare what's written before time, before in that day. Revelation 13, 13 and 14. You want to read that for us, Rose? Revelation 13, 13 and 14. Uh, talks about the beast here and. Uh, the beast with the lamb like horns, which is the false prophet, and uh, deceives the people by miracles. Okay? 13 and 14. Okay. And he doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of, to the beast, which had the wounds by a sword and did live. Yeah, this, this idea of the false prophet and the beast comes up again and again. These are the, prime, the, the primary actors in the battle of Armageddon, right? And who are they fighting against? Let's look at Revelation 17 now. And it talks about the same, uh, same idea. Revelation 17, 13, and 14. Uh, want to read that for us? Come on. 17, 13, and 14. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called chose and chosen and faithful. Right. Another description here of uh, the battle against the Lamb, just before Jesus comes. This is right close to the second coming. Now let's look at another one. It's the, the one that talks about Armageddon actually names it. Revelation 16, Revelation 16, 12 to 16. These last, uh, these last chapters of Revelation are not necessarily all in that way order, but they're all related some way to the same thing. Uh, 16, Revelation 16, 12 to 16. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they have a spirit of devils working there, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and may see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Yeah. It's a transliteration from the Hebrew, Hebrew word in the, in the Greek text here. 
So, uh, Armageddon. Uh, it's interesting here that uh, there's a number of symbols here, River Euphrates. Uh, what do we know about the River Euphrates in the Old Testament? The River Euphrates were dried up, right? And who dried it up? Cyrus. The kings of the east, right? Go ahead, what'd you say? Cyrus. Cyrus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cyrus uh, and, uh, and other kings from the east mm -hmm. were involved here. There were a number of countries in the east of, uh, of Babylon, and they come along, and they dry up the river. So what does that mean in the end time, drying up a river? This is primarily, remember, a spiritual battle. And uh, so drying up that river means that there's, uh, there's something very, very important going to happen here, right? Babylon's going to be overthrown. When Babylon is overthrown, that is the result, end result of Armageddon. Is that right? And uh, God's people are freed. Let's read another text that talks something about this. It's Revelation, or not, sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says here in this verse, watch for it. At that time, thy people shall be delivered. Are, are you interested in that at all? <laughs> yes, indeed. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Melinda, you want to read that for us? <laughs> Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. All these verses are related. This is the final conflict. <clears throat> and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake to some everlasting life and some shame and everlasting contempt. Yeah. Two groups of people in that special resurrection, right? Just uh, before Jesus comes. So, uh, interesting ideas. We're coming close to that time. Let's read another one that's very similar to this. It uh, comes right after this. Actually, the, the seventh plague is um, comes right after this idea of the fall of Babylon and is about the hailstones, okay? This is just about congruent with the second coming. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the hailstones begin to fall? <laughs> this building will be shattered. It will be, uh, the cities of the earth will be broken down. Uh, tremendous results. Let's, uh, let's read, uh, did I give a text out already? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I did. No. Uh, let's go next to Jeremiah chapter 4. Oh, before that, let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 6 and the, uh, the last two verses, 15 and 16 and 17. 15 to 17. Can I read that before it's mine to read? Revelation 6. Actually, we, we could uh, read from 12 onward if you want to do that. Um, this is another description of the second coming of Christ. Uh, chapter 6 and 12 then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. let's, let's read 12 on down to the end. Okay. Well, no, that's too, far, too early. 14, 14 to 17. Yeah. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For, uh, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to say? Yeah, thank you. Let's read another one that's very, very related to this. It's Jeremiah chapter 4. All these things happening about the same time, including with the actual appearance of Jesus in the clouds of heaven. 
Jeremiah 4. Just before you do And let's see if you're Rodney, can you read those? Jeremiah 4. And uh, he'll start with verse 23 to 27. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld it, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all his cities were broken down. How many of the cities? All. All the cities. That means there were, were cities, right? Mm -hmm. Now they're all broken down. Go ahead. At the presence of the Lord, by his fierce anger, for thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Somebody want to make a comment about that last phrase, that last part of that last sentence? Yes. But when Jeremiah saw this, yeah. I think he thought it was the absolute end of this world and life on it. Yeah. Everything's gone, everything's yeah. done. But the Lord said, ah, 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 <laughs> we're not quite done. It may look like we're done, yeah. but there's more yet. This is at the beginning of the thousand years. This is the beginning years. of it. Yeah. It's been destroyed and it's going to be that way for a thousand yeah. years. But after that, yeah. after that, mm -hmm. not only do we resurrect all of the wicked, yeah. but we also recreate the earth. Yeah. At the end. A new earth. It will be back to beautiful yeah. exactly. perfection of, of original creation. Today I was in a Bible study and a man said, I said something about recreating the earth. And he said, no, he said, it's going to be a whole new earth. A whole new earth. And he really stuck on that idea. But uh, I didn't pursue that very far, very long, because uh, but, uh, you know, uh, he's going to redo the world, right? That's right? It'll be a new heaven, a new a new atmosphere. That's right. When Jesus comes, I think the air is all going to be pretty, our atmosphere is going to be affected too. The elements melt with fervent heat, and you imagine all that. Well, there's all kinds of junk up, on, up in space. Yeah. yeah, there is a lot of it. Probably come tumbling down, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Let's turn to Jeremiah 25 now. It follows up on this a little bit. Doubles down on it. Jeremiah chapter 25. Verse 33. And uh let me get that one. Jeremiah 25, verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dumb upon the ground. Yeah. So uh, pretty pretty devastating. And uh, as Pastor Jim said, this is uh, how the earth will look during the millennium. It will remain this way. So, uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful passage in Spirit of Prophecy. It goes something like this. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness. The church is to enter her final conflict. Remember it said in Revelation 17 uh, that the... That that uh, the land shall overcome them, and with him are the chosen, the called, the faithful, called, chosen, and faithful. Uh, clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church, who's that? Those who have been chosen and called. Cho called and chosen, I should say. How many are called? All. All, all are called, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're chosen because they... Accept the call. Because yeah. they choose. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, clad in the armor of Christ, right? the church is to enter a final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. This conflict is a conflict that's going to take place. As the loud crying goes forth, it's going to be a terrible time. Uh, the sanctuary in heaven is going to be open, and there'll be earthquakes and smoke, right? Let's read about that. It's Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Revelation 11, verse 19. Does this make anybody frightened? Don't be frightened. 
this one who is coming and who is the the centerpiece of all of this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His name is called the what? The Word of God. And he has a vesture dipped in what? Blood. Blood. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit here. We'll kind of talk about that a bit. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 19. As this is beginning to take place, notice what happens on earth. Sanctuary is open. The law of God is seen. And on earth, notice what happens. Verse 19. 11, verse 19. Uh -huh, let's see what we Hardly seen. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the, his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Yeah, we know about that, don't we? We read about it in the very armor again. Yeah. Somebody, I don't know, I've never found the reference, but somebody told me, he was actually studying to be an Adventist pastor, that Mrs. White says that at, at, their, at the end of time that the Ten Commandments will be revealed and that the Sabbath commandment will be stand, will stand out mm -hmm. as in bas relief. Do you know anything about that? Well, I have heard that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can give you chapter and verse. It's in the spirit of prophecy yeah. on the next time play. For the world to see. For the world to see. Evidently. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wow. Before yeah. the second coming, huh? Before the second coming. Oh, really? That's what I have heard. Yeah. Now, I know something similar that happens at the end of the millennium also. <clears throat> up in the sky, the great throne. and Yes. You, you, you might send me home to look it up. Uh, I, I'm familiar with the concept. Yeah. Uh, the, the way I remember it is when I went back to read it, it wasn't 100% clear that she meant literally shown in the sky, but rather mm -hmm. that the idea that it's yeah. there would be presented to people. They would understand mm -hmm. it's there. They would understand that it may have been a symbolic thing. Mm -hmm. that the work that we have to do to, to show people what's happening in, in, in the final conflict and, and what's happening in, in the heavenly sanctuary. Sure, God's law is enshrined there and his Sabbath is a part of it. Uh, so it could have been a symbolic thing. Yeah. But, but she does talk about that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'd have to go back and look again. And, and reading it again, I might, I might take it more literally, yeah, yeah. more more symbolically I, than I remember it. It's an interesting concept. It is. I mean, it would be terribly exciting to have the actual Ten Commandments show, yes. shown to the world, oh, yes. Oh, yes. and the Sabbath commandments standing out. I mean, from the sky, no from less. The sky, no, le no less. Yeah. Well, you know, from everything I read, it the woman sitting on the beast doesn't hide the fact mm -hmm. that this is her yeah. uh, creation, that this is what she has done. Yeah. Yeah. And everything I read, and whether it's in their Catholicism yeah. or in the letters that was written in the 1890s, where they just went out and flat out told all Protestant churches, we don't understand what you're protesting. Mm -hmm. You're and following our day. Yeah, we've got, got a pamphlet out there in the in yes. the foyer. Yes. Uh, I urge you to, it's a white one with, uh, is it red lettering or yes. black lettering? Yeah. Top right hand on the corner. Right yeah. on the corner. Are you yeah. talking about the Catholics convert? Right. Uh, no. No, no, no. no there's another one out there. What, yeah. what the Catholics say about Protestant. Yeah. Well, the, the convert's uh, catechism. It's yes. a little book yeah. like mm -hmm. this. You've probably seen it. Yeah, I have. The, the Catholic Church claims the change of Saturday oh, yeah. to Sunday as a mark of her authority. Of her authority. Page that's 50. a very word. Yeah. Page 51. Exactly. And even on the back of the book, they pro that's what they say. If you're looking at that book, that's, that's what they want yeah. you to notice. Those are very helpful ideas when you're talking about some of the end time events with new people. Very, very good. What? The Catholics admit to doing it. Not only do they admit to doing it, but they, they, they chastise Protestants right. for following their example. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, when I think about what you were sharing, uh, before uh, the ark was closed, mm -hmm. God gave a whole warning to the whole world when mm -hmm. all those animals got on that ark. Oh, yeah, Noah's ark. That was supernatural evidence. It was. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd been there that day and saw all that happening, what would you have thought? Wow. I think I'd get on that ark. <laughs> I think I'd get on real quick. <laughs> Those animals. Yeah. Stupid animals, right? Yeah. <laughs> Guided to the ark. Yeah. 
What would people with brains think of that when they saw something like that? It's time to go aboard. Right, right. <laughs> what soul do you want me in? Yeah. <laughs> they probably thought they better get out of the way if they get trampled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, do we have any copies of that little converts? Uh, Catechism. You have to buy those. What you, but in the church, if you look up on the right hand side of the back there, there's a mm -hmm. little white book with red letters on it. But that's not the same thing. No, no, no it's not the same. It's a different book. You do? Yeah. The oh, I have one somewhere, but I can't find it. I, read it. Yeah, yeah, I, I have one in the car right out here now. We sent away for a bunch of them. Yes, yeah. Right. We were actually visiting a cat with my young man. Yeah. And an older man with his nice young son. Yeah. And they were Catholics, and we showed him that it, the Catholics, because he said that was the Ten Commandments, so they go, well, that's the Ten Commandments you know. Yes. <laughs> but that's not the ones in the Bible. He goes, oh, yeah, it is. It's written right in the Catechism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right in the Catechism. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it actually leaves the second one out, and also the fourth one. Well, the fourth one isn't left out, but it says remember. And, and they people. proclaim it's a Sabbath. But yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They say Saturday's a Sabbath. They, that, they don't have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But they say we have been keeping it at the time of Martin Luther for a thousand years mm -hmm. to Sunday. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's what that book over there, they, this is their letters. Mm -hmm. so There's some evidence have, like, that, that Martin Luther actually was questioning their keeping of Sunday. He had some questions about it, but he never really came completely out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, anyway. Well, you know, the forces are gathering already for the Battle of Armageddon. Have you noticed it in the news? Sure. The forces are gathering. There's going to be two gatherings. God's people gather on Mount Zion, right? Mm -hmm. And where do the others gather? In the Valley of Megiddo. Yeah. <laughs> But that's, that is symbolic. Yes. It's, it's a worldwide conflict in the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, yeah. It, do you think that with what we're seeing, you know, people right now are um, demagoguing mm -hmm. the uh, Judaism. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be considered Juda Judaisms? I have no doubt. First, first, second and third century Christians were lumped in with the Jews, and the Jews were not good citizens during those years, not good Roman citizens. And Christians didn't want to be associated with the Jews. And uh, Bakiofi, have you heard that? Have you, yeah. you know that name? Yes. He wrote a number of books. One of them is about Sunday. He went to the uh, school yeah. in Rome, okay? That's right. And he talks about the history here. And uh, actually, he got a high grade on his dissertation. But he mentions that in there, that early Christians, second and third century Christians, were trying to avoid being lumped in with the, with the Jews who keep Sabbath. So for a while, he said, they kept two days. Sabbath was a day of fasting and prayer, mm -hmm. the seventh-day Sabbath. And Sunday was a day of celebration. Now, after one or two generations, children holding their empty stomachs all day on Sabbath, what do you think they're going to do in the next generation? They're going to gravitate towards Sunday. He talks about that. And uh, so gradually it came in among Christians. And by the time of Constantine, uh, it was uh, pretty well cemented. Three, 321, I think, is the date of the first Sunday morning. Actually, we don't have Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. You can look this up on your, on your computer now. But the old... Pers uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica talks, there's a whole section in there about the first Sunday law and Constantine 321 and the change of the Sabbath mm -hmm. in a worldly book. Wow. It's, it's history. It's a matter of history. Yeah. Don't have to go to add those sources to find it. Mm -hmm. it. It's on the computer too. It's on the internet. It's a, yeah, I'm sure it's in the computers. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, Christ rides forth with the armies of heaven. Love has been rejected. Love has been rejected. You know the most cr cruel thing in the world is the rejection of somebody's love for you. And Christ's love was soundly rejected. 
and still is. And uh, so, Jesus drank the cup all the way dry. No one in the universe but he himself can fully appreciate the last hours of his passion in Gethsemane and on the cross. Nobody can even, I don't think the angels, they, they desire to look into it, but nobody can understand what he went through. And so he comes forth now, victorious, riding on a white horse, and his vesture is dipped in what? Blood. Blood. Do you kind of get the picture? The Battle of Armageddon is about over. The armies of heaven are riding forth. Spiritual battle. On earth a loud cry will be going forth. The final warning message will be, will be being given. And it culminates in the fall of Babel, the physical fall of Babel. I read about that in chapter 18. So uh, his vesture is dipped in blood. His garment of righteousness is dipped in blood. There's a text in the Bible that's reminiscent of that. Let's turn to it. It's Romans chapter 5, verse 11. I'm sorry, I think it's verse 10. Let's see, who's next here? Um, John. Romans 5, verse 10. I guess I got the wrong verse. Is it Romans 5, verse 10? Oh, 9. Okay. That was 11. I'm sorry. For if when we were enemies, we were uh, reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, what do I want to talk about that a little bit? Hallelujah. Two things involved here. We, he was our substitute in death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus took my place. He's my substitute in death. His blood, right? But what about his life? It's just much more by his life. That white coat that he has on as he rides through the heavens on a white horse represents his purity, right? His righteous life. And that was dipped in blood. It was a perfect life that died on the cross for me. He takes my place. It had to be a perfect life. Otherwise, he couldn't be my substitute. Nobody could do that except God, one who is the author of life. Yes. Now, there's irony in the scripture. I don't know where the scripture is, but where it says that the, the righteous will wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. They're, they're making their robes white in blood. White and blood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You happen to know that off the top of your head, that scripture? Um, yes, it's in it's in Revelation chapter twelve. Let's turn to it. I thought for you knew it. <laughs> no, maybe not. It's in Revelation. Though. It's verse eleven. Verse eleven is close, but it's not the one you're looking for. What did you say? I just said it's in Revelation somewhere. It is. It is. It's in Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 12, verse 11. I don't think this is the one you're really referring to, but... No. It's not. They, they wash their robes in the blood. I, 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 know, I know what you're talking about. It might be chapter 5. Or, but anyway, um, yeah. Some of you have a computer. You can... Uh, a computer about the size of a three by five car. You have that in your pocket. <laughs> Revelation seven fourteen. Seven fourteen. Let's read it. Revelation seven verse fourteen. There it is. And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, so uh, uh, 
a righteous life died. The Bible says he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Obedient, obedient, righteous. So the great armies of heaven, you know, there's twice as many loyal angels as there are, <laughs> as there are fallen angels. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. In verse 12 of Revelation 19, it talks about he has a name written that no one knew except himself. Okay. And that's not clear in our culture. But in ancient cultures, even the kings of Egypt would have many names. And they would never tell you all their names. Because your name and your image and you are so closely related and interchangeable that what happens to one happens to all. Uh, and so after you're dead and gone, if I chisel your name off of your monuments, I'm getting you in the afterlife. <laughs> you're accessible to me through your name. Uh, and, and so they would inscribe the names deep in the stones on, the, on their places that you couldn't carve them off so easily. Um, and they would have a name that they never told anybody in part because if, if I know your name, I can use your powers that are represented in that name, whatever magical powers you might have. I have access to it if I know your name. Hmm. And so what this is saying is Jesus has a name that nobody knows except himself. Nobody holds the string on him. He's nobody's puppet. Hmm. Nobody controls him. Good thought. He has more in reserve yeah. than we can understand or touch. Amen. There's more there. And, and, and so it, it's playing off those old ideas of the name you hold in reserve so nobody can control you mm -hmm. or have complete understanding of you or complete access to you and who you are and what your powers are. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere else in scripture somebody asks what is your name? And, and the Lord replies, why are you asking that? It's marvelous. It's kind of like, yeah, I'm not, not giving that up. <laughs> There's some things I'm not handing over to yeah. your knowledge because of the way they're thinking. Uh, there, there are some things that are beyond our understanding. Right. And make him unique in the powers that he has beyond what we see in the know. The name of God was unpronounceable back at one point. Well, the, yeah, out of respect. Out of respect. Mm -hmm. He didn't pronounce his name. No. But, but even, no, no. even no, no. we still think that when we call on God's name, we're calling on him and his power. Right. Uh, and, and so it's, it's related to all of that. Sure. Uh, but this, this, it's that yeah. name that you don't give out. I like your explanation. Jim. Yeah, very good. <laughs> well, one of these days, the mark of the beast is going to be merged upon us. The first angel says, Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. Why should we ever fear to worship him? Victory is on our side. There are twice as many good angels as there are evil ones. And the word of God himself is coming. And his word goes before him. His eyes are like flames of fire. Why would we fear to worship him? Many are going to receive the mark of the beast because they because they're afraid. Because they're afraid, huh? They're going to lose their house, they're going to lose their car. You know, life is going to go up right up until the second coming. There are going to be people, like in the days of Noah, right up until the day, mm -hmm. there are going to be people trying to live life in a normal way, even though things are pretty bad around them. Mm -hmm. And uh, while that's going on, the mark of the beast will be urged upon people, and people will be afraid to do that. Why would we be afraid? Let's read a text. Well, I like it. I've read here before. 2 Timothy 1.7. Let's never be afraid to worship Jesus. We may feel like in the end time we're a minority. In fact, in the spirit of prophecy says it may be with our situation like we're the only one. Maybe alone. Was Jesus alone? Yeah. Yes. But we need a text like this, a promise like this, to to realize that we can be carried through. Second Timothy verse seven. And I uh, don't know who's down on the other end there. I see the whole down. I guess it's a care, a care yeah. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yeah, that's what we can. That's what we can. That's what we can claim. Sound mind. I need a sound mind. Okay, all good. Right. So uh, even though it may seem like we're in the more minority. You know, he's above every earthly power. He's the king of kings, it says in this, and lord of lords. And uh, well able to re rescue the weakest among us. The weakest among us. Armageddon is good news for the believer in Jesus. Pastor? Yes. The, the world has never seen the full out power of God. No. They've never seen it. No. But they're going to. They're going to. They're going to see it. Yeah. This is going to be huge. So the unforgiven ones who will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming, which happens right after the seventh plague, seventh plague, and God delivers his people. And uh, we read, I think, Revelation. Or Daniel. We read Daniel 12, verse 1. But I'd like us to have us turn to Titus 2, verse 13. Here's where our home is headed. Uh, Titus 2, verse 13. Let's see, where are we here? Yes. Right. Yeah. You want to read that for me? Titus. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Go on a little bit. No, whether you can go on if you want to. Yeah, well, that's okay. Um, well, this is uh, Titus 2, verse uh, 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And I was going to read 14. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, okay. it's connected. Uh, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Right. Now, this word hope, the blessed hope, this word hope is not optimism. No. This is. Hope is a person. Let's read about it. It's first, it's, uh, it's uh, Hebrews. I'm trying to call it up here. 6 verses 19 and 20. <laughs> Hebrews 6 verses 19 and 20. Hmm. Hope is a person. <laughs> Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Notice here, he's our anchor. Hope isn't just some kind of optimism. It's where hope is going to happen someday. No, this is a now. We're not hoping for something. A hope is an anchor, or it is something real and tangible. Let's see, where are we here? Uh, Jim, you want to read that one? 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. 19 and 20. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, as one which enters within the veil. Where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Right. Hope is an anchor. Hope is a person. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first word. You will, if you do that in a meaningful way, be a justified believer. And justification is like a rainbow over us. And under that rainbow, we're given an opportunity to grow. We call that sanctification, don't we? But we have that rainbow of promise over us. It's a rainbow. You like to see a rainbow? Yeah, Noah. That's a promise. It's a promise. And under that rainbow, the rainbow says that we, you know, his promise is to us that we are, he, he doesn't look at us as sinners anymore. That's what justification is, right? And under that rainbow, we can grow more and more like Jesus every day. We're not perfect now, but we will. And, and it, it says in, in 1 John 3, we will see him at that day. Let's turn to 1 John 3. One of one of the three. First John, I'm just kind of freelancing here. We got a minute or two left. First John 3, 1 to 3. Oh, I love this. This is good. Uh, David, I think, has memorized this. Much of first, second, and third John. I love it. 
This is probably the most comforting words in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Janelle has the last word. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is, and everyone who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. For the believer, this is the conclusion of our gift. This is what God has been looking for now for 6,000 years, a whole community of people who put all their faith and trust in him. And we're in that time right now, and we need to spend some time every day Study the Word for the purpose of knowing Jesus, whom to know in eternal life. So, pray. Hebrews 11, 4. Yes. That's what we're going to get. That's right. Remember what it says? Hebrews 11, 4. It's basically it says about, uh, uh, no, I don't know exactly what that one says. I'll read it to you. Hebrews 11, 4. Yeah. We were talking that's, about it earlier. That's the faith chapter. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gift, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Yeah. Ready, you have a thought. Yeah, no. again, linguistically. Uh, in Spanish, the word for hope can also be translated as expectation. Okay. Which I think is a better, really mm -hmm. a better word, mm -hmm. because we don't just hope for it. No. Oh boy, I hope he comes. Hope is no, we expect it. Yeah. It's our expectation. Yeah. yeah. That's like the word fear God, when it actually a better translation is respects God. Yeah. 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 Kind of like that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a noun, not a verb. Yeah. So, so I wonder, uh, Craig, would you pray for us? Wonderful Father, we are humbled in your presence and so thankful that you have chosen us at this time in this place to be here to witness for you. Now, dear Lord, give us the Holy Spirit that we might walk in your presence and do your will. Help us not to fall short of this glorious thing that you have bestowed upon us, that we might honor you, our Lord and our God. I want to remember all our members of this wonderful church that has gathered here Sabbath after Sabbath. Thank you for causing this church to grow exponentially. And the Bisbee Church, how wonderful you have blessed Southeast Arizona. And we're thankful that your presence is coming more and more brighter and more seen here in this wonderful area. Now, Lord, as we lift you up, thank you for all that you have done for us, given us, and guided us into. And we pray that you go with each of us as we go home. But all praise goes to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name Amen. 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 This little church sitting right here on the main street with a sign out front is a monument to the Creator God. And this parking lot's full every week.